Okay, today's lecture is on linear regression analysis. Uh, with regression analysis, what you try to do is figure out if there's a correlation or relationship among your independent variables and your dependent variables. So let's take this example here, and uh, let's say that we've got x, which is our independent variable, which is hours of instruction. Let's say we're training some new employees uh, for their jobs, and, and we think there might be a correlation between the hours of instruction versus the number of units they can produce. So the units here, the y variable, that's the, uh, the dependent variable. y is dependent on x. So let's say that we've got these five points, that we've trained one person one hour and they produced five units. We've trained another person two hours and, and they produced four units. Another person we trained three hours and they produced six units. Another person they produced, we instructed them four hours. We trained them four hours and they produced eight units. And another person we trained five hours and they produced seven. So it looks like there is a relationship that the more training hours and instruction I get, the more productivity you're going to get out of these employees. <clears throat> so with least squares regression, what you do is you put a line, it's linear regression, so it's a straight line, right through the center of those points. It's called least squares regression because the distance from each point squared is minimized. Okay? So what we do is get the slope, the rise over the run of the line, and we get the intercept where it crosses the y-axis. In this case, it crosses the 3.6, and we'll see how that's calculated in one second. So, here's the least squares formula, and you're probably only going to do this a couple times in your life using a formula with regression analysis. But it's interesting to see how it can be done by hand. So the slope is equal to the summation of x times y minus the summation of x times the summation of y over n, in this case n is 5, our sample size, over the, square, uh, the summation of x squared minus the summation of x squared over n. So we've got the result here. You can see that it's 0.8. Okay? So how do you calculate each one of those? To do it by hand, what I usually do is I put my data down. My x is hours of instruction, 1 through 5. y is our units of productivity. And then you take x times y, x squared, and sum each up one of, the, of those. So then these go directly to 15, 30, 98, 55. Go directly 98, 15, 30, and 55. And then 15 squared, of course, in the formula itself. So it's just a matter of plugging into the formula. All right. Um, next I've got y hat, which is the predicted y, and then the residual column, but we'll come back to that in a second. Once you've got your b sub 1, which we calculated to be 0.8, you can calculate your b sub 0, which is your intercept. So your intercept is the average y minus b sub 1 times your average x. So your average y is 30 over 5 or 6. Your average x is 15 over 5 or 3. So using this formula then, your uh, intercept, b sub 0, is equal to 6 minus 0 0.8 times 3, or 3.6. So here's the formula. y hat is equal to b sub 0, the intercept, plus the slope times your x. So plugging in b sub 0 of 3.6 and b sub 1 of 0.8, you've got your regression equation, and you can use that uh, for predicting hours of instruction, assuming that it's statistically significant. That's another question. So using this formula then, that's how we calculate each of these y hats here, plugging in um, 1, Times three, one times three, uh, or one times 0 0.8 plus 3.6 is 4.4. Two times 0 0.8 plus 3.6 is 
So these are the predicted y's here, just plugging the x's into the formula. Okay? And the final one, we've got the residuals. The resi residuals are like the error. So it's just y minus y hat. So 5 minus what we predicted, 4.4, gives us 0.6 residual. 4 minus 5.2 gives us a residual of minus 1.2. 6 minus 6 is 0. We're right on target there. 8 minus 6.8 1.2. 7 minus 7.6 is negative 0.6. So once again, those are called residuals. And then what we can do is plot them. Plot those residuals in a residual plot. You got your x down here. This is one way to do it. You got your residual here. Notice that we're right on target with the 3 at 0. And then we had plus 0.6 minus 1.2, plus 1.2, and, and uh, minus 0.6. Well, why would you want to take a look at the residual plot? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And that, that's because of the assumptions that we laid down with regression analysis. First, we assume that our relationship is linear. And if it's not linear, you're going to see it in the residual plot, because there's going to be like a curve here with these residuals. And you'll also see that on the data plot as well. So you want this to be fairly random, okay? You don't want any, uh, any type of patterns here. So, for example, um, we also need to have uh, a normal distribution of your residuals. So they should be tighter around the center and fewer data points as you go to the ends. So it should be like a, a normal distribution. So your residuals are normally distributed. That's another assumption. Also, you don't want to have any patterns that go like this, like a curvy pattern. That would be out of correlation. You might have some seasonality component or something in your data that, that could cause that. That's called out of correlation. So if you've got that, you've got to fix it somehow. You also want to see it, the same distribution here as over here. And you don't want to see it tight, tight here, and then as you go out, get wider and wider and wider. That's called heteroscedasticity, if it does that, in one direction, or if it's wider, wider, wider here, and then tighter here, or wider on the ends and tighter in the middle and wider on the end again. Okay, that's called heteroscedasticity, and there's ways to fix that. That's a little outside the scope of this class. But anyway, you don't want to see any patterns here. Uh, autocorrelation, heteroscedasticity, um, and we're going to extend this model when we get to the next video to uh, multiple regression analysis. Multiple regression is where you throw in another variable. So instead of having just one x, you might have uh, a couple of x's or, or more. Well, anyway, once you've developed your model, you've got to decide if, you're, if you can use your model, if it's statistically significant. So we're going to do a hypothesis test on beta. Beta sub 1, that's the slope. That's the slope from the population. Remember, in statistics, we use the Greek letters for the population parameters, the actual, you know, our actual uh, from the data. Um, and the, the B, the lowercase b sub 1 and b sub 0, that's just from our, those are called sample statistics from what we calculate. So what we're wondering is if the actual slope in the actual population is 0 versus not. And we're going to do a hypothesis test on that. You could do a t-test. But the easy thing to do is uh, just look at your p-value. The p-value is going to be on the regression printout. If your p-value is less than your alpha level, you reject a null hypothesis, where the alpha level is the level of significance of your test. Typically, it's 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0 0.10. So if your p-value is less than that, typically 0 0.05, then you can reject a null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, then you're saying, yes, there is a statistically significant relationship between these two variables, and we can go ahead and use the model then for prediction if you want to. Other times you're just interested if there is a relationship or not, so you can report on that. The P itself is the probability of observing what you have in your sample by chance. So that's the probability. If this is true, this, the P is the probability of observing that in your data.